ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is uh, Domenico Lombardi, Managing Director and the General Director of the San Marino Bank. And I've been uh, the Director of the Center for International Governance Innovation. So I welcome you to this event that has become a standard event at the meeting. It's a event uh, on uh, the economic challenges, opportunities, and perspective for Europe. So we have uh, three high-flying speakers that I'm about to introduce in a second. But before doing that, I would like to take stock of the current status of world economy. And in particular, I would like to focus on European economy. And probably European economy represents uh, important part of that scenario. So last year, we had some good news. First of all, the world growth uh, consolidated. So this year, world uh, economy will have a 3% growth rate, 3.5% uh, of uh, growth rate. And uh, behind this, we can see two trends. First of all, the growth in China. China grows with... Uh, an average growth rate of 6.5% uh, of its GDP. So every 10 years, its economy doubles and its real salary level. And India, as well, has a growth rate between 7 and 8%. So globally, we see that uh, there have been changes uh, since uh, the start of the international economic crisis 2007-2009. And uh, another piece of good news uh, is that uh, the economy of the euro area is about uh, to stabilize, in particular according to the last estimated outlooks of the European Monetary Fund, Italy should grow by 1.3%. So half a point more than the previous uh, outlooks dating back to last April. So these are good news. When it comes to the political dynamics in Europe, well, there as well we have some encouraging facts compared with the previous year. I would like to underscore the outcome of the French elections and the election of Emmanuel Macron with uh, a reformist approach, and uh, Anne-Laure Delatte, uh, our guest, uh, will tell us more about that, uh, and the uh, possible re-election and likely re-election of Angela Merkel in Germany, and our guest Zettelmeier will tell us more about that in a second, and also the uh, weakening of the hard Brexit position resulting from the weak uh, victory of Theresa May last June in the UK, and Eric Jones will tell us more about uh, this topic. So, I've mentioned uh, some data, I've talked about GDP growth rates, but these are quantitative data, these are aggregated data, so this is just about the quantitative side, but we know that the quality of the growth is equally important as its quantity, so also when it comes to the distribution of growth, and in particular, the political uh, approaches that support such growth. And from that point of view, unfortunately, we have some uh, weak points because the euro area is still weak uh, in some respects. So let's think about uh, the capital gain and the surplus that has now Germany, about 8%. Uh, so this is an aggregated demand uh, that uh, I mean is not available for the remaining euro area. Let's think about the huge debt level of many EU countries like Italy. And until a few weeks ago, there was a new record that was unfortunately overcome. We have 2.3 trillion euros of Italian debt. And in spite of some uh, positive outlooks about uh, the expected GDP growth for Italy, we have generally still a weak economy, especially also when it comes to the labor market uh, and uh, the share of young people and uh, women to the labor market. So there are some structural problems still that um, should not be underestimated. In other words, it is important to talk about uh, 
economic policies and understand if these better outlook we are faced with uh, will make things easier or more difficult, especially reform-wise. And this is very important, especially when it comes to trying to make the most of differences and diversity. And this is what Professor Vitadini told us yesterday in his speech, how to use the margin of maneuver that we have now. This margin of maneuver increased and got larger, and we should try to take stock of it and use it in order to uh, earn and possess the legacy bequeathed uh, to us by our fathers. So again, uh, reforms uh, still seem to be difficult, uh, and also the European house construction projects seem to be a bit weakened, and also there's some forms of deglobalization that uh, can be seen here and there in the world, uh, among others in the US. And well, we're going to tackle all of these topics, and that's why we have three high-flying speakers, so three excellent guests. So. We have uh, to my right, uh, Alor Delatte, Vice Director of the CEPII, so the most important French think tank. She's also a French uh, councillor of uh, the French of the Prime Minister, uh, the French Prime Minister. She's also a member of the uh, Bank of France uh, the Scientific Committee, and she's also a visiting professor at Princeton University in the US. To my left. We have uh, Mr. Setemeyer, Senior Fellow at Peterson's Institute for International Economics in Washington. The Peterson Institute is the major world think tank when it comes to international economy. And uh, before getting to this post, he was the General Director of the Economic Ministry of Germany. He was the head of economic counselors of the Vice Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel. And before that, it was the research director of the BERS, uh, the European Bank for, uh, um, research, and for research and Development. And um, so he has dealt with uh, restructuring of sovereign debts, uh, fiscal policies, economic policies. Uh, sorry, the, he was uh, uh, in charge of the European Bank for Construction and Development. And uh, also we have uh, Professor Eric Jones. Uh, professor Eric Jones uh, is uh, a professor at the uh, School for International Studies uh, for Job Hopkins University. He has been living uh, in Europe for more than 20 years. He's an expert when it comes to European topics and uh, is a very special observer and very often his uh, point of views are extremely interesting and uh, he has published a lot. He was a curator of the Oxford Handbook of the European Union, a very important publication, and also of the Oxford Handbook of Italian Politics. He's senior research fellow at the Malcolm College at Oxford University. He's a commentator and a columnist uh, when it comes to European, Italian, international press. Uh, and well, um, I don't want to elaborate too much. I'll simply tell you how we're going to proceed. So the speakers, uh, we have uh, 10 minutes each for a short uh, presentation. Then there's going to be a bit of follow-up uh, within the panel with questions linking up with their presentation. And then maybe we're going to take questions from the audience in case you want to ask questions to our exceptional panelists. So we can start. And I would like to start with Anne-Laure. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Domenico. Grazie, Domenico per, uh, Thank you very much, Domenico, for having invited me here. I used to uh, talk in silent in the past. Uh, purtroppo, purtroppo non posso seguire in italiano. Okay. Um, so, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to um, quickly talk about the, um, ah, okay, so I can move the slide. All right. Uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce my, my uh, talk with uh, some um, 
quite uh, some element of background uh, related with the financial crisis, the euro crisis, which uh, took place, uh, which started in 2010, and then give some uh, elements about the new momentum that we are experiencing now, trying to give some uh, context on uh, the reform agenda that might uh, that might be implemented after the German election uh, this fall. And you'll see that I will emphasize the political, well, I'm an economist, but I will try to emphasize the political dimension of uh, the context. So um, let me start with some um, comments on the, um, the, tr the one, one of the key pillar of uh, the European project uh, was and is still the, the Franco-German alliance. Okay, so Franco-German alliance is an engine of uh, European integration and it looks that it's sputtered uh, over the last decades. Uh, the traditional power, uh, the traditional balance of power among Europe's uh, major states shifted dramatically during the crisis. The Euro crisis has actually turned France into a secondary player. Why? Because uh, obviously the Euro crisis has hit France much more severely than uh, uh, Germany uh, in terms of uh, government debt to GDP, in terms of unemployment, uh, in terms of growth, deterioration of uh, the trade balance, etc., etc. So it's quite difficult for France to claim, um, you know, a leading role or a role of co-equal uh, leader of the European project. Who is able to finance the series of bailouts? Therefore, um, probably the, um, it, it, it went from a cooperation to more hierarchical relationship between Germany and France. Basically, German leads and France follows. Um, and France has a kind of a middle role child in uh, Europe where the big brother is Germany and the uh, younger uh, brothers and siblings are um, the southern countries. So France is in between and uh, it's relegated to soften the edges of an austere currency union. While at the same time, Germany has turned into quite a reluctant leader, if you think of it. Germany has actively engaged on all fronts, and it has been involved, uh, it has been the most important member of the resolution team during the crisis. However, German people have a moral hazard obsession. So uh, they are quite reluctant to fund or favor quick and forceful commitments to regional bailouts, strong interventions by the ECB, every single time something needed to be, uh, a decision needs to be made quickly, Germany would step in. So Germany has managed to both resolve and exacerbate the crisis. Now we're experiencing a new momentum, clearly. Well, on the one hand, Brexit has given us everywhere in, uh, in Europe has given us a, a sense of a shock, which is unless real progress is made, the whole uh, EU project may totally sink. And uh, the second element of uh, momentum, obviously, is the election of Macron, President Macron, uh, which is uh, obviously a, a very important uh, victory against populist political parties. Um, and there are hopes that the Franco-German alliance will reboot. So um, you are obviously all aware of the German election taking place at the end of September. So Macron has been elected in May in France. People are preparing the reform agenda. Nobody speaks about it, but everything's going to take place after the German elections. So there are strong hopes that uh, German and French will again um, speak and try to reform uh, the, um, the EU and the EMU. Um, well, this reform agenda um, has been thought about and uh, there has been a lot of uh, writings about it, including the five president reports, which is a very important publication uh, trying to lay down the, the, the principle of uh, uh, how to reform 
the, the euro area. Uh, there's been also the reflection paper by the European Commission, which is deepening the economic and monetary union, which uh, was published in May 2017. So it looks like there is a lot of material to try and think about those reforms. Um, very quickly on the real front, um, it's been, um, so the, the report, uh, the, the different reports uh, deal with economic and fiscal union. I'll get back to the fiscal union. On the financial front, um, it's, uh, it deals with banking union and how to uh, resolve the, the banking uh, balance sheet issues. And on the government's front, uh, those different reports um, try and emphasize the need to uh, have a higher, uh, a better democratic accountability and stronger institutions. All right, this is the reform agenda. We have real front, financial front, and governance front. But now, um, what can be really implemented? That's the, that's the, the hot question. As an economist, um, I would uh, say that the most important to make this so this, uh, our monetary union sustainable is to have some risk sharing. It's an absolute request. You cannot have a uh, um, sustainable monetary union without some transfer, which makes adjustment possible in, uh, in the case of uh, some shock hitting one member. You need the others to, tr to, to transfer uh, resources to the hardly hit members. Think of the US. Uh, California has not been hit, or Florida. Take Florida. Florida has not been hit the same by the real estate crisis in 2007 as in New York. Uh, but there's been some transfer. So risk sharing is an absolute request in the monetary union if you want it to be uh, sustainable. But what's going on here? Inherited imbalances make risk sharing very problematic currently. Uh, there are high levels of legacy public debt and bank fragility. I probably don't need to elaborate on uh, bank fragility here in Italy. So there are a lot of taboo. Um, if you go to Brussels, for example, you cannot pronounce the word eurobonds, or you can pronounce the terms uh, fiscal union, or people, there is a kind of solidarity fatigue in Europe, especially from the German uh, perspective. Um, so I would say that uh, President Macron is very, uh, is quite um, uh, famous to be uh, very pragmatic. So uh, he will probably, for example, to give you an example, the, the, um, he will try and not reproduce the mistakes of the former President Hollande who is trying to emphasize the need for euro bonds because nobody wants it, they are euro bonds. So let's not try with this. So he's gonna be uh, more, um, probably more, um, yeah, pragmatic, but let's see what he can do. Now I'm taking off my jacket of uh, someone working with the government, right? I'm an academic initially. Look at the heterogeneity uh, cost in the eurozone, uh, there are lots. There are high heterogeneity costs arising from very diverse preferences across populations. High costs become politically prohibitive. For example, fiscal and political union is probably an idea that French people really like. I would say that you, 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 I would say that uh, Italian should be in favor of more political union and more fiscal transfers. But Germany is totally definitely uh, against uh, the, this idea. Um, and the big question is, uh, we've been so far, we've moved forward so far, but uh, the, now the question is, have heterogeneity cost and constraint eventually become binding? How can we go? Uh, um, all right, I have two minutes more, I think. So I would say that uh, to understand the problematic in, uh, in Europe, you need to uh, understand the tensions between the two models of integration. There is a need to coordinate the local domestic interests and, so, uh, and the European uh, interests. So there is a need for a double governance. 
But think of it again. The US were similar, and there was there always been a tension between the federal and the state level. And the whole story of Hamilton and Jefferson battle was about this double governance um, um, need. And the US have been marked with this uh, double tension. We need to have in mind that it took them 130 years to complete their currency. When the US dollar was introduced at the, uh, in 1792, it was not um, um, an efficient currency. It was not a sustainable currency. And it took them 130 years to make it sustainable after, let's say, 1930, the, the 30s, um, after the implementation of a central bank and fiscal transfer that Roosevelt uh, implemented. But there is a huge difference between the US. So first of all, we, we obviously don't have uh, 130 years. We barely have one year. And second, um, the huge difference between Europe and the US is that they had a constitution from the beginning. Constitution created the framework for economic institutions in the US. In Europe, we created economic institutions before constitution. So that's a big difference. And that's why my conclusion will be, uh, will try and emphasize the political dimension of this crisis and of the European integration uh, project. In Europe, what we could, cr uh, a critical that could be made to uh, the European institutions is that uh, there is barely any position for rival set of leadership and uh, rival uh, policy agenda. Come on, I've been talking about the, the French and German alliance. So that's like, there is a key pillar and Germany is obviously the leader. So, um, I mean, if you think of the way uh, the crisis has been, the, the crisis have been addressed, a lot has been addressed in uh, 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 behind the doors uh, with some difficulty to, um, yeah, to, to take into account uh, the position of um, Greece or southern countries. Uh, the European Union can actually adopt policies not supported by a majority of citizens. Think of austerity. Uh, the policy process is actually based on rules rather than being a political process. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, what we need is a model of union that transcends the either or logic of integration or sovereignty. We need um, to provide a decision making capacity without relocating power from democratic nation states to less democratic supranational states. So, uh, in, uh, in other words, we, we need a more democratic, uh, we, we need more democratic institution at the European level. Um, we need an equal access to the levers of political power. Um, there are different uh, uh, solutions uh, on the table. Uh, the one that have been discussed are Parliament for the Eurozone or a new constitution. We can talk about that in the Q&A session. Uh, that's, yeah, that's how I would like to conclude. In, emphasize the political dimension of this crisis. Thank you, anne -Laure. Now I'd like to leave the floor to Jeremy Zettelmeier. My question to him is, uh, is whether this uh, positive uh, economic situation we are facing can increase or decrease uh, our room for maneuver. And I'd like to ask him where he thinks it's best needed to have reforms, to add reforms in the monetary union of the Eurozone. And Laura also talked about the transfer of resources, about fiscal union, about euro bonds. These are all topics. Uh, that apparently are not very popular within uh, the uh, German government. You've also worked for the German gov government. Uh, can you comment also on this aspect, maybe in the last part of your presentation? Much. My name is Jan Hitz. It's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to be here. 
so, so my role is to somehow give you a, a German perspective. It, you know, but of course, I'm not in the Nordic government, and you know, in, in many ways, I, I feel more uh, European uh, than, than German. But I will nonetheless try a uh, little bit. I, I may mention the word moral hazard uh, once or twice just to get some credibility. So maybe to start off with, so the I'm obviously extremely pleased that this meeting is uh, under a wonderful quote by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, our greatest poet. And so I thought my, my role as a German was to put the quote on the slide in the, in the original German and point out one thing that is quite important about this uh, quote, which was actually missed in the English translation. Fortunately, it, the Italian translation has it right, which is the word fater, fathers, or padri. So very important, it's plural, right? And so this is something we should be remembering uh, at this meeting. Uh, Europe has many fathers. And, and mothers, and we are responsible to all of them because what they achieved after the war was historically completely unprecedented. And I do not want to be part of the generation that destroys that. And I believe this is all the, also the spirit of this meeting. Then I, I have one short comment on Anlaw's um, presentation. So Anlaw made the point that because Germany is economically larger and arguably more successful than France, um, it, it is now the leader and, and it was more difficult for France to lead. So, so this is true to some extent, but I think it is offset by something, which is that Germany does not like to lead. And in fact, Germany is deeply skeptical of the very concept of leadership for historical reasons. France is not as inhibited in this respect. France likes to lead. And so I think there is an opportunity there. So I would describe Germany more as a veto player uh, than as a leader. So Germany is the figure in the room that will you know, occasionally stop the others or maybe try to set the rules, but not so much lead on a day-to-day -day basis. And this can be a problem when fast leadership is required. It is often lacking. This is, of course, the problem of the Euro crisis management when we would have needed much stronger and much quicker leadership from Germany, a less passive role. Uh, Mrs. Merkel, for all her wonderful qualities has been quite passive. It is her style to react rather than to lead. But there's also an opportunity associated with this because um, if Macron comes up with good ideas or future Italian prime ministers come up with uh, good ideas, this of course uh, is something that Germany would very much welcome, uh, I think. So there's space for common decision making that comes out of the fact that Germany feels more like a veto player than a, than a leader. Now, let me take you a little bit through my, my view of where Europe stands economically and where the Euro architecture reform debate stands. So first on the state of the Euro area, I think there's a bright side, which Domenico mentioned in his introduction. We have a broad-based recovery that is underway. Uh, there is uh, progress in addressing banking problems. I think Italy has made important progress uh, in this respect. I think what has happened here in the last year is, is mostly a good thing. And of course, we have a feeling, we are hoping that the populist wave is ebbing. Now, there continue to be some uh, important problems. One of them, which is sort of a little bit technical, but it's a, a very deep point, is the continued very close interconnection between uh, countries, sovereigns, and their banks. 
their national banks, their own banks. This is not really something that's supposed to happen in a currency union, um, and much less in a financially integrated area, right? There's no reason why really an Italian bank should be holding specifically Italian bonds as opposed to other bonds, but this continues to be the case. Uh, in spite of the fact that growth has been picking up, we do have, I think, structurally weak growth in several countries. So Italy in particular has a growth problem, it has had this problem for a while. We are not sure to what extent this problem is permanent uh, in the sense that it could be around even after some of the debt problems of the um, financial and euro crisis have been resolved. We really don't know. So my hope is, and there's I think s some good economists who would argue that once the banking system has been entirely cleaned up, uh, Italian growth will be back uh, where it should be, which is roughly where German growth is, or maybe higher because output gaps are higher in, in Italy, but we are not sure. Uh, we suspect that there are deeper structural reasons and we have to deal with them. Just to mention two other points, we, we do have an ongoing migration crisis. Uh, it has been suppressed, but we know that it is not addressed. Uh, particularly Italians know this. We need a common response for this, and we have not been able to line this up in a convincing way. And finally, we, we have the problem of, of Brexit. I, I do not think now that Brexit is going to trigger uh, you know, an unraveling of the European Union, but it is an annoyance. Uh, it will create lots of complications. It is just a frustrating and wholly unnecessary thing, both for the European Union and particularly, of course, for the UK, and I, I feel particularly sorry for the young people uh, in the UK. Now, on the state of the euro area reform. So this goes a little bit into the topics that Anlaw mentioned. Again, we have a bright side and we have some problems. So there's no question that we have made big institutional progress with the banking union. We do have better safety nets. Uh, they're not complete, but we do have better safety nets. Uh, I've recently written a column uh, with uh, a colleague from the Peterson Institute arguing that, for example, if it Italy were to run into a problem, I think we could resolve it uh, in the context of the existing institutions. But uh, we have a long way to go. So I do agree with Anlaw that we have insufficient insurance stabilization mechanisms, so we do not yet have common uh, fiscal instruments, or only at a very low level. We have no euro-level deposit insurance, and we have quite fragmented capital markets. We do have the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, which I do not like very much. Uh, I do not like it as an economist because it is a very clumsy way uh, and sometimes counterproductive way of trying to get countries to do the right thing, but I also do not like it politically. And the reason why I do not like it politically is because it's a constant source of friction. Basically what you have is you know, a very blunt instrument that doesn't really, that really, really fits. And so you have a European Commission that is trying to enforce something that does not very work very well. And it basically does what a reasonable technocrat would do in that situation, which is it tries to find compromises. But from the perspective of the country that is being put under pressure, it still feels pretty heavy handed. And from the perspective of the North, Germany and other fiscally conservative countries, the focus is on the compromise. And so no one is happy. Uh, the South is not happy because it's being uh, put under the pressure of rules that are, it feels like they come from uh, bureaucrats in Brussels. The Germans are not happy because they think that the bureaucrats in Brussels are no longer really defending uh, the rules uh, in a strong sense. Uh, and so everyone is unhappy with each other, and in particular, everyone is unhappy with Brussels. Um, Brussels is, becomes the common problem, even though for completely different reasons and, and very unfairly. And I think that is 
a big problem for Europe because Brussels is the symbol and the expression of European integration. So if we all beat up on Brussels, we are beating up on the European project at some level. And my final point, and this is where my, my Germanic uh, side comes out, we, we do not really have effective market discipline in the Euro area. We are starting to introduce it for banks. So we have made some progress there. We do not have it for sovereigns. We had it, of course, during the crisis. We had too much market discipline during the crisis. And what we wanted is to get out of the crisis. And so we developed the big bazooka, the outright managed trade transactions program of, of the ECB. And that took away the market discipline, which is fine for the time being. But I think uh, in the medium and long run, we will have to bring it back. Why? Because otherwise, we have to rely on other instruments, like clumsy rules uh, that really do not solve economic problems very well and, and create political problems. So wh what are some reform views of how to get out of this uh, situation? Well, the problem is we, we have quite different views in Europe. Uh, so there are not entirely op op opposed, so I will, I will show you this, but they, they look to be entirely opposed. So the South, which is a short rent for Italy and, and a few other countries, wants less interference in national policy. It wants more flexible rules. It was, wants additional risk sharing and civilization options. On, on this, France is largely supportive. It wants a euro level deposit insurance and maybe it wants a capital market union, but no one really knows what that means. And so, you know, people are not too hot on this. It's not, it's not in, the, in the center stage. Well, the North um, actually wants more interference in national policy because it thinks the South should be reforming more. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily want more interference in its own national policy, right? So here we have a little bit of a hypocrisy. Uh, and because it's still, likes rules, you know, that is, I do believe, a, a German national feature. We, we just love rules. Uh, we want them to be less flexible, uh, not more. And we certainly do not want extra risk sharing and stabilization options if they give rise to systematic redistribution, right? Because we want countries to act in a way that you know, they have incentives to take care of their own problems. And if they can rely on risk sharing or stabilization options that take care of their problems, uh, even if their policies are bad, that is not a good thing. So this is the moral hazard argument. And we definitely do not want uh, European level deposit insurance in the North. Capital market union we are okay with, but again, no one really knows what that, what that means exactly. So I find that sometimes you're reminded of an American children's book. So in, in the US, this would be recognized instantly. And in, in Rimini, it takes a little uh, explanation. So this is uh, by an American author, Dr. Zeus. And he has these two characters. They are the, the South going Zach and the North going Zach. And they have been both told by their mothers never to deviate from their north-going or south-going paths. So they have to go and remain true to their south-going or north-going heritage and do not, uh, and not budge. Uh, stay on your path. And so Dr. Zeus writes that it happened that both of them came to a place when they bumped. There they stood foot to foot face to face. And so, you know, this is a dilemma. Uh, they just uh, stood there. So what happened? Uh, none of them budged. And eventually, the world adapted to that. And they built highways right over those two stubborn zacks and left them there standing unbudged in their tracks. And so I think this is a great um, image for what will happen to Europe if we do not uh, find a compromise, which is Europe will become irrelevant. The world will integrate around us and will ignore us. 
So we need a um, solution, therefore, and this is my last uh, slide. Uh, so the question is whether, in light of the fact that the positions are so opposed, there's any room. And so my view is that there is uh, some room, and so I have written it on the first two points on this slide. So the basic strategy has to be to go for more stabilization and insurance, but in a way that does not lead to systematic transfers. And I should, I should uh, stress by systematic transfers, what I mean is permanent transfers, right? There will always be some transfer going on, but the key thing is that you cannot predict who will get the next transfer. And you cannot game getting a transfer by designing your policies in a particular way. And the second point, which is the general point I made before, is that I think we have to rely less on rules to get countries in the European Union uh, to do good behavior. We have to treat countries more like grown-ups, like adults. But if these adults then do stupid things, they do have to suffer the consequences uh, uh, more. And so I think that in that sense, market discipline is an important uh, tool. Now, there are problems with implementing this. So you can design stabilization mechanisms that avoid permanent transfers, but it's complicated. And politicians do not like complicated things. There's a suspicion that complicated uh, plans can be gamed and are fragile. And of course, the other problem is that more market discipline is a very nice thing to say in theory, but when you have a whole lot of debt and vulnerabilities, market discipline can immediately trigger a crisis. Uh, and so this is uh, why the South is worried about this. Now, again, these problems can be solved with timing, commitment, and so forth, but it takes a huge amount to do it. Brains, leadership, lots of goodwill, and of course, some willingness to take uh, risks. And so it can be done, but we will need very strong politicians. It would be ba nice to have this guy back. He had the brains, you know, the manners, the poetry, to solve problems, and he was a statesman, by the way. He was not just a poet. In the meantime, having Macron is quite a good start, I think. So, those are my remarks. Thank you very much. Let's now move on to Eric Jones in particular. Well, I would like to say that uh, Europe is exposed to a double shock. On the one hand, there is uh, a greater level of uh, sort of distance towards the European institutions. On the other hand, we have this deglobalization phenomenon that uh, is setting forth also in the Western world. So please, could you please elaborate on that, Eric? Thank you. Good morning. I, I, I guess it's really not morning anymore, but, but we'll pretend that it is. Look, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about the future prospects for the European economy. But the brief they gave me was to discuss deglobalization, the rise of populism, Brexit, transatlantic relations, and the current state of economic performance. I want to do that within the overarching theme of the conference, which tells us to make the most of what we've inherited and to face the world as it really is. I want to do this in five points. Since I have 10 minutes, I'll try to spend about two minutes on each. These points concern what we inherited, the role of perspective, the power of emotion over reason, where this emotion is leading us, and what can be done about it so that the world we leave behind is at least as good as the world we entered. Let's start with what we inherited. 
The focus here is primarily on institutions. At the domestic level, we could point to liberal democracy, the market economy, and the welfare state. At the European level, we'd point to the single currency, the European Union, and a suite of other organizations that are much less famous and yet still important. And across the Atlantic, we have NATO and what can only be described as the world's deepest economic relationship. At the global level, we have the UN organizations, globalization, and the G20. I mention these things because it's so easy to complain about any of these institutions. Everything is in need of reform. Democracy is not representative. The market economy is inequitable. The welfare state is making matters worse and not better. What's true for the national level is even more true for Europe. Just think about the criticisms leveled at the Euro, the European Union, and all the rest. The transatlantic relationship is hardly any better. Both NATO and the transatlantic trade and investment partnership were in trouble before Donald Trump became president. As for the UN, the G20, and globalization, these are valuable institutions but they are also deeply problematic. So from one perspective, we could argue that what we have inherited is a tangled nest of problems. But that is only one perspective. And it should make us wonder why the people who came before us invested so much in creating these institutions in the first place. That suggests another perspective. Each of the institutions that we've inherited was once regarded as a great advancement. What we see as a problem, the people who came before us saw as a solution. That change in perspective is important because it forces us to consider what our inheritance, inheritance does for us and what we may inadvertently take for granted. It also forces us to ask what we will lose if we don't take proper care of that inheritance. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. We spend a lot of time complaining about the rise of populism. Why don't we ask instead what happened to our traditional political parties? Those parties were created to help integrate European voters into the democratic process. Their function was precisely to ensure that people were represented and to prevent people from organizing against liberal institutions. Indeed, the whole of Western democracy is built around the effective functioning of those political parties. Populists have always been a challenge. If they're making headway now, it's because of the weakness of the mainstream parties and not the strength of populist movements. The European Union and Brexit offer another illustration. The British applied three times to join the European Economic Community. They had a popular referendum to validate their choice of membership. And they had a powerful influence on the evolution of the European project, and particularly the completion of the internal market. If you look at most of the complaints of the British, therefore, it is ironic that they center on how the single market functions. They dislike common regulations and standards, and they fear the free movement of people, particularly after Europe's historic enlargement. 
Yet these are all things that the British government advocated. So why is it that the British have turned against them? I place a lot of emphasis on perspective, but the real force of the argument comes from emotion. When you survey the British on why they voted to leave, they will tell you, quite frankly, that they want to take back control. If you explain that they have more influence working through European institutions than outside them, they simply won't believe you. You can reason all you want, but they have the force of emotion to support their argument. You can find similar emotions on both sides of the Atlantic. Those emotions explain why so many Germans rebelled against the investor state settlement provisions in the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. They also explain why the Walloon Parliament voiced such strong opposition to the Canada-Europe trade agreement. And they explain why millions of Americans voted for Donald Trump. I'm not trying to denigrate these choices. Emotions are not just powerful, but they are also important. You cannot have legitimacy without emotion. Emotion is also crucial to faith. So when I say that people are basing their economic decisions on emotion, I'm not trying to say that these people are being irrational. I'm trying to say that we should listen to those emotions and then try to figure out how best to respond. This argument about emotions is not just a matter of politics. What we're learning is how important emotion is to economics as well. This is where the argument is leading us on both sides of the Atlantic. Economists used to believe that emotion was idiosyncratic. If we aggregate enough people together, those emotions should cancel each other out. That belief has underpinned the design of many of our institutions. The global trading system is one illustration. Liberalized global finance is another. What we learned during the recent crisis, however, is that emotion is even more powerful in economics than it is in politics. Actually, learned is probably too strong a word. If you read the great economists like John Maynard Keynes, the lesson they drew from the Great Depression was very similar. That is why policymakers focus so much attention on the promotion of full employment. It is why the post-war economic system was built on the basis of capital controls. The challenge is not to go back to the solutions of the past. Rather, it is to adapt the institutions that we have inherited to meet the requirements of the present and the future. That adaptation is where financial economists have been working for the past two decades and more. Now we are able to build on their insights. The European Banking Union is one example, and yet there are other arrangements that we could establish. I would be happy to discuss those in detail later. We also need to adapt our labor markets and trading relations. The goal is not simply to maximize welfare, but also to pay attention to the needs of those who suffer most from any necessary adjustment. Ironically, this was the policy agenda that Europe was adopting before the recent crisis. In 2005, the Belgian economist André Sapir showed how we do not need to trade off equity for efficiency. We can adapt our welfare state institutions and trading relations to achieve both goals at once. That was what the European Commission was trying to accomplish 
before the financial crisis hijacked the policy agenda. Now that the crisis appears to be receding, and the question is whether we can devote the political attention and resources that the new reform agenda requires. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eric, for your contribution. I'd like to seize this opportunity to ask a question. Yesterday, I was listening to the Italian Prime Minister Paolo Gentiloni, who talked about the importance of multilateralism in this uh, context. A multilateral order is very important, and within this order, the United States played a fundamental role. Uh, they've played a fundamental role since the end of the Second World War, and yet, in the future, we have uh, to come to terms with the passive leadership of the United States, uh, uh, for example, in, within the G7 or within the United Nations or the International Monetary Fund. What do you think? Can Europe make up for this uh, reduced leadership of the United States? Uh, also taking into account what Mr. Zettelmeier said, uh, that is to say the fact that uh, also Germany is reluctant. Unfortunately, the answer is not very comforting. Leadership at the global level is a very expensive project. It involves a huge amount of investment in political and economic resources. It also involves a perspective at the national level that policy bankers can communicate to their supporters to explain how making an investment in other countries today will generate huge returns for the leader itself at some point in the future. This was an argument that we could make in the United States in the 1940s and 50s it's an argument that we could revisit even in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But at this point in time in the United States, there's no desire to invest in the present for others to reap rewards in the future for the United States. Unfortunately, I don't see that desire across Europe either. There's too much concern for the present in European politics and not enough attention given to the future. As a consequence of which, not only do we not see European leadership at the global level, but we're seeing too little investment in solving the real problems of the present, problems associated with migration, financial stability, and all the rest. to uh, just add a comment on uh, how, uh, whether Europe can actually um, take over or uh, if, it's, uh, yeah, if it's able to take over. Um, so if you think of the political context, the international political context, we've lived in a multilateral world since the uh, end of the Second World War, even a, a little bit before. Uh, now this rise of populism means a rise of firsters, which means there are countries which think that first is better, US first, UK first, Russia first. So they are challenging this idea of multilateralism and they think that bilateral relation, bilateral agreement is better for them because they think that US first is better. Um, so I don't know if Europe is able to do it, but Europe should do it because we need multilater multilateral relationships, uh, especially if you think of the, the importance, uh, as Eric was emphasizing, financial stability, health, security, migration, environment, all those important problems are called global public goods. There is no way to manage that at the national level. So it's, it's a big mistake to think that you can actually address the most important uh, world issues 
which are those global public goods at an individual or within at an individual level or within uh, bilateral uh, agreements. So I think that uh, Europe precisely has a very important role to to uh, to uh, play, and in fact, we are even if we don't do it uh, perfectly, we still are a very are probably the most advanced multilateral organization. E gentlemen, invece mh, vorrei ritornare a te eh, nella tua relazione. Gentlemen, I would like to draw back to what you said in your contribution you talked about the European Monetary Union and the role of Germany. In uh, preparing myself for this uh, meeting, I was looking at the graph of the spread between long-term Italian bonds and uh, the German bond. And actually We've seen that the spread has considerably reduced, although it has uh, started uh, rising up again. Having said this, however, 950 basis points, but uh, actually the uh, Italian spread is still very low. Can this be in line with some explanations? Can this... Uh, be explained, for example, by the fact that Italy will remain in the euro zone, irrespective of future developments. Another possible explanation might be that in case of Germany, the European Central Bank, Germany, European institutions will step in in favor of Italy in case of a crisis. How do you explain these low levels of the Italian spread? compared to the values uh, that we had some years ago? There are, there are basically two stories going on. So w one of them, of course, is uh, the, the obvious effect of uh, ECB monetary policy and uh, ECB bond purchase on, on the uh, Italian uh, debt market. Uh, and, and so, you know, because these purchases have been so massive, they, they would probably influence uh, the yields, even if there were a greater underlying market skepticism about uh, Italy. This said, though, you know, it, it, Italian yields came down very rapidly after the announcement of the uh, outright monetary transactions program by the ECB. A and so if you look at the difference between crisis yields and where they are now, most of it preceded the quantitative easing program of the, of the ECB. And, and so I think that for the most part, the low yields uh, reflect a faith that European institutions could handle a future crisis in Italy and keep Italy in the euro, as you said. So I do think there is this um, belief. And to tell you the truth, I, d I do think this belief is, is rational because um, if you look at the numbers, Italy has done a lot of fiscal adjustment uh, in the past. And if an accident were to happen and the you know safety net were to kick in, uh, the conditions that Italy would have to satisfy on the fiscal front, so in other words, the austerity that it would have to deliver um, to get the, the relief uh, from the ECB and, and the European uh, stability mechanism I is very minor, right? So, so most of the fiscal adjustment is in the, is in the past. Italy does have considerable primary surpluses e even now. And, and so I think it, it would work, you know, you could have an Italian program uh, that would be very generously funded and it, it would work. But there's, of course, one footnote. It will work only as long as there's an Italian government that's willing to play that game. And so I think the point that you are hinting at, which is that if there is some sort of populist takeover in Italy, that this would create a, a real risk, which is not reflected in the spreads. This this is accurate, right? So, so there is, if you like, a tail risk out there that is not reflected. Um, 
and I hope markets are right and not reflecting it. Jerry, um, but I would have a radical, a more radical line. Why are the Italian bond price uh, so high? I mean, why are the, the spreads so low? That's because of Super Mario, Super Mario Draghi. And what he said in July 2012, I'm, I'm speaking very loud. Okay, am I speaking very loud? Okay. Uh, and that's after what he said in July 2012, I'll do whatever it takes. And, and you could see the bond spread uh, reduced. So uh, Super Mario has basically rescued uh, the entire Europe and especially uh, Italy. Uh, and what he did was, it's just self-fulfilling prophecy. He didn't even have to step in. The very fact that the central bank, which is the lender of last resort, said, I will do whatever it takes, just calm down the market. Now, that means that can we stop QE? Can we stop this accommodative uh, uh, monetary uh, policy? I don't think so. I would say that the euro crisis is definitely not over, but it's just under a cover, and it's called the QE. Um, so as long as financial and uh, more precisely banking balance sheets have not been cleaned, QE will have to stay. And if QE is stopped, the spread will just go up. Thank you, Anne-Laure. We have the time to take a couple of cash questions from the floor. I can already see that there are a couple of questions from uh, someone in the front line. Please uh, tell your name. I think we need a mic. Or maybe, if you want, you can go to the podium. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Antonius D'Agostriano. I'm the Indonesian ambassador to the Holy See. Uh, Mr. Lombardi and Ms. Delati mentioned in the opening remark that the elected of President Macron has important factor in stabilizing the European economic uh, situation. In the last three weeks, I read in, in the media that uh, the popularity of President Macron has decreased. My question is, will it be an important factor to destabilize the European economy? Thank you very much. So this seems to me a very important question. I don't know if Anna Laura wants to answer in the first place, and then maybe the other two uh, speakers may want to add their comments. They're more than welcome. I, I would be quite optimistic because this uh, decline of popularity by pres uh, for President Macron is really related to internal, um, the internal, the domestic and, um, context in France. It's very related to the loi du travail, so the labor reform, the, 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 the reform of the labor market. So it's very related with internal issues. And I would say that um, obviously, you're right that if his, if his popularity stays very low for a long time, that might reduce his uh, ability to, uh, like his credibility, his legitimacy uh, in Europe. But um, as, I, I, I want, as I emphasize, the reform agenda will really, people have been working on this reform agenda for the last two years and especially s since the, the election of uh, President Macron. Now, this, the, the day after uh, Merkel's election, those people will gather and try and have and discuss uh, ideas as uh, Jerry was emphasizing, let's have ideas and we'll try to implement them. So I don't think that this decline of popularity, which is very related to very specific uh, uh, internal debate, will um, 
damage its legitimacy uh, as a European leader uh, at the European level. I mean. Erika, do you intervene here? Yeah, I, I, I'm not French. But, but I do look with some alarm at the evolution of French politics. We keep talking about the rise of populism. But those of us who study French politics have been worried about populism in France at least since the 1980s. The, the big breakthrough came in 2002. And at each of these milestones, it was the weakness of the traditional political parties that suggested problems for the future. I'm very happy that Macron is president. He, he has a terrific team around him. He's very impressive. But he became president by destroying the two main political parties. And so if, heaven forbid, something should happen to him politically that takes him out of the game, what structure is left for French politics that allows us to anticipate how that country will evolve politically in the future? I'm not talking about a populist takeover. I'm not even talking about the National Front. I'm talking about the pure uncertainty that will surround the French political context and make it very difficult for us to plan for effective policymaking, particularly in the Franco-German axis. So I wish him all the best and worry quite a lot that he might not succeed. There's another question. Good morning. My name is Miro Fiordi, and I'm the president of Credito Valtellinese, a bank listed also on the stock exchange. I would like to ask our reputed speakers who delivered the very interesting speeches, two questions. The first one is the following. What is your take on the fact that the banking union has not been completed yet? The banking union was thought as a response to the crisis to stabilize the banking situation. Well, it was supposed to have three legs. First, the creation of a unique surveillance body at European level, with uh, national states losing their sovereignty and giving it to a, a European body. Secondly, the creation of a mechanism for the uh, sol resolution of a banking crisis, and that was done, the creation of such an authority. But the third leg, so the creation of uh, a mechanism of the Paris insurance at European level is blocked, and essentially is blocked by Germany. This is a major issue because a political agreement was made at European level on a certain agenda to create a banking union, but de facto, the third leg is still missing because it is blocked. There's a standstill and no rapid solution is foreseeable, not at least for now. Then there's a second question about the rules having to do with the motion. And uh, Professor Sattermeyer said everybody is complaining about Brussels, uh, Northern European countries for some reasons, Southern European countries for other reasons. But, well, this is a political matter, nothing but that. In Italy, for instance, it is not clear why 
a great level of priority is put on uh, credit risk management, but when it comes to the level of risk uh, of other entities, in particular of banks, there's a, a different level of attention, and there's no attention at all about the risks of uh, derivatives uh, in uh, uh, bank uh, financial statements. Uh, this may seem to be a technical issue, but this has to do with many large French and German banks, so European entities say that this is not a priority for now. Well, just to be clearer for maybe non-experts, the question is the following. If I have a credit and I have to uh, sort of consider the risk level, I have to provision capital, but uh, if there are uh, I mean, equities that are riskier, no additional provision is made now. So, because of this, uh, there are big asymmetries at competitive level in Europe that are generated because of that. I would like to know your opinion and how can we overcome these asymmetrical situations that from an emotional point of view, well, when it comes not only to the people, but to the leadership of a country, generates a quiet, worrying debate. Thank you. Thank you very much for raising these uh, very relevant topics. I would like to give the floor, first of all, to Mr. Zettelmeyer, because probably is the best sort of person to answer. were very good points. Uh, so, so as far as, as I understood it, there, there were two parts to the question. There was, the second point was about, if I understand it correctly, regulatory reform and supervisory reform being, being too narrow and, and leaving risks not covered. And, and so I, I agree with that. So there is no common European structure that has to do with the regulation and supervision of uh, what's called wholesale markets. So basically in investment uh, activities, um, investment houses, back office functions. And so this is something that needs to be addressed. And you know, if you want to interpret the Brexit as offering some sort of upside, this may be the upside, uh, because the relocation of these activities from London to the uh, Euro area m may trigger, may force um, taking this issue um, uh, up more aggressively. Uh, there is a European Securities and Markets Authority that probably needs, needs more power, that needs to be built into something that would be equivalent to the single supervisory mechanism for banks. And, and so maybe, maybe that will happen. Uh, the, the other point, which I think was the, the more urgent one, was you know, why is um, the third leg of the banking union stuck? And so the, the, the reason, of course, is, is that uh, in, the, in the German view, the common deposit insurance um, should, uh, requires some sense of, you know, roughly <coughs> equal risk of national banking systems that would be insured with this common European money and, and we are very far from that uh, state. In particular, we are very far from that state because uh, different European banking systems have vastly different exposures to their own sovereigns and these sovereigns have very different uh, credit qualities, very different uh, uh, strength. And, and so what Germany in effect did is saying is that it is requiring uh, the, a regulatory reform of the regulatory uh, treatment of, of sovereign exposures as the quid pro quo for European deposit insurance. But that in turn, as, as you well know, could lead to much higher sovereign spreads in places like Italy and maybe uh, 
a need for more capital in, in some banks, and that in turn creates a problem for poor countries like Italy. And so this is where we are stuck. Um, I, I don't think it's hopeless, so I think there are some solutions. So one solution would be to combine a regulatory reform with some kind of common European safe asset. And that is being discussed. So the European Systemic Risk Board has a task force that's thinking about this. Another would be to drop the maximalist version of a single tier European deposit system and uh, replace it by a two tier system where there's a European backstop so the initial risks are borne at the sovereign level. So there are several things one can do, but I agree with you that this is a really key, uh, a really key point. Eric, will you intervene? Maybe Eric, you would like to add something? Making three quick points. First, I think German is absolutely right. The real problem is trying to figure out how we make a transition to a situation where we can argue more effectively for a European deposit insurance scheme. Because we are losing that argument now. And losing that argument is unacceptable for two reasons. And these are my second and third points. First, deposit insurance is a powerful instrument for competition between banks, particularly in times of crisis. I was in Belgium in 2011 when Deutsche Bank converted from being a subsidiary covered by Belgian deposit insurance to being a branch covered by German deposit insurance. And Deutsche Bank took out a full page ad in the main Flemish newspaper to advertise how much safer it would be to move your money from a Belgian bank to Deutsche Bank to take advantage of this difference. That kind of competition is inimical to the functioning of the single market and cannot be tolerated. The second thing has to do with the comment that Anne-Laure made. The US federal fiscal system actually does not transfer resources across geographic space in the way that is assumed by much of the macroeconomics profession. There is one exception, and that is the deposit insurance scheme. And the need for those geographic transfers is a lesson that we have learned and forgotten and relearned repeatedly in the history, financial history, of the United States. If you were to look in the 1980s, for example, when all the banks were about to fail in places like Maryland or Colorado or Texas, these were banks that were chartered at the state level and insured at the state level. The government had to step in, the federal government, to provide deposit insurance because that was the only way to keep those state governments from going bankrupt. We don't want to experience a situation like that in Europe. We need to have a system to prevent that choice from having to be made. So thank you, Eric. I would like to apologize with those who have questions, but we uh, have uh, uh, run late. I, before closing this session, I have a message for you on the part of the organizers. Um, there is a possibility this year as well to contribute to the funding of the meeting. And there are uh, places within the meeting called Dona Ora. So donations, fundraising is possible only in these places. So by way of conclusion, I would like to thank very much uh, the outstanding rapporteurs who have come from abroad. I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers. I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting, of the Rimini meeting, for this wonderful venue, CG as well, for having co sponsored this meeting, uh, and you all for being here. Thank you very much.